What we have here is the stand that we welded for the Mittler Brothers finger brake. What we showed in the last video was cutting, sanding, fabrication, uh, assembly of this stand. And today we're gonna show the priming and painting, mounting the machine to it so that we can test it out and see how it works and see if our design gave us the improvements that we wanted. So we are going to quickly prep this and paint this before it gets dark. We're quickly running out of light here, so let's get moving. What I recommend is acetone is a good uh, degreaser and cleaner for metal surfaces. You're gonna wanna use a rag, something that's as lint-free as possible, kind of towel-like if, if you have something like that, or Home Depot has these too. And you want a good set of gloves. Do not use the regular nitrile gloves. A lot of the gloves you get at your hardware store are not impervious to acetone. They'll only last a couple of minutes and you do not want this stuff being absorbed into your skin. Super volatile and very not good for you. So find something, a rubber that specifically says that it will resist acetone. The first way that gives you a little bit of scrubbing power is basically soak the rag in the acetone and you're gonna use this to wipe down every surface of your project. And this helps you get rid of any grease, oil, dust, anything that it's going to prevent the paint from sticking. If you have already cleaned the tubes, the metal, or you have a really good clean part, sometimes you can get away with using a squirt bottle and just squirting the acetone and letting it evaporate. It's gonna evaporate very quickly. One benefit of the squirt bottle method, if you have a project, you know, the aesthetics are very important, it will reduce the amount of lint that you'll get. These white rags, as good as they are, will often leave string here and there of lint on whatever it's catching. And then when you go to paint it, you're gonna see the lint sometimes poking up. Okay, so we're gonna do a quick thin coat of primer on here. Automotive or self-etching are probably the better ones. They'll have a little bit better chemical bond to the metal. The metal, you don't need to slather it on like paint. If you have a few spots where it's a little thin or you missed it, it's okay. In fact, if you go too thick with the primer, it will actually make the paint chip off easier because you'll have too much space in between the metal and the paint and it makes the paint weaker. So here's a little tip for you. There's a little black dot where the spray cap meets the can. If you line up your arrow of the spray can with that black dot, you're supposed to get the most paint out of the can. Uh, this is the Rust-Oleum Deep Blue. It was the closest off the shelf color I could find that should match the machine itself. So we'll see what it looks like after it dries and hope it matches. <laughs> Spray painting with cans or a gun takes a decent amount of practice. Usually I can get it done with one coat and that's the best for efficiency, but it really takes a lot of practice to be able to get one clean, shiny coat on there without having it run or have spots that you missed. It's a very fine line in between those two. The reflection of the light is the biggest indicator. As soon as you get that glossy coverage, you need to stop.
Like I mentioned in the other video, we don't really recommend making a custom stand for something unless you have a couple of good reasons for doing it. The time involved and the fabrication involved is usually more than it would cost you to just buy the one that the factory makes, unless you're adding features and things that you want and you want to customize it. <laughs> So here's a tip, something I just learned. What I did is I took all the fingers and took the bottom leaf bars out. If you just try to throw them back in, they won't seat all the way. You'll have about a quarter of an inch gap um, or an eighth inch under your alignment cut here and the bar. And that's just due to over travel of the handle. If you pull the handle out a little bit, it'll seat in place. So you just wanna make, the, make sure that those are seated all the way before you go ahead and tighten them down. So this is the finished product of our project for today. The machine mounted on the stand, it's all reassembled and ready to go. So what I wanted to talk about here is the reasons why we did this. The primary reasons are the height difference. The factory stand is 21 inches off the ground. This one we made 25 inches off the ground. We did that because I'm a taller person, I'm 6'2", and I'm the one that's gonna be using this the most. And it's more ergonomic for me to be able to operate this without having to bend down. That's kind of a common thing for a lot of machine tools even today is that they're made for shorter people on average. I know from experience that doing a short production run or a whole day of work on a machine like this, if I have to bend down and pull up and do movements like that, I'm gonna feel it in my shoulders and my back. The other reasons were the clearance underneath. The factory stand has a shelf here. It's kind of the same design, just upside down and they have a shelf on top. We wanted to eliminate the shelf because that does have a tendency to collect tools and parts and clutter and pieces and hardware. When you go to use a machine like this, you end up knocking stuff over, you know, it falls on the floor and wanted to avoid that uh, completely with this. Another reason is clearance. There's all this room back here and this is what I wanted was all of this clearance. What I'm imagining is having long parts or large parts that may already have existing bends. Sometimes it's advantageous to be able to slide it in the back and do a bend on the front. And you have this clearance back here to allow the part to fit. Any capacity we can add to this machine that's handy in the future is a good goal for us. And then the last part is the casters. Pretty much everything in the shop is mobile that is light enough to move. Putting these on casters makes it so that I can roll it around and push it out of the way when we're not using it or give us more room to work or put it next to another machine we might be using. If you're not familiar with a finger brake or sheet metal bending equipment, it's really just for bending thin pieces of steel, aluminum, whatever kind of sheet metal you're working with. It's a simple thing. You have a clamp on the fingers up here. You're setting your gap on the bottom, so you need to have enough room for the thickness of the material to clear your bottom. You clamp it on the top, and then you're pulling this handle to do your bend and you can get whatever angle you need out of it. And you can adjust the bending radius with your clearance and the radius on the fingers. So that's a quick look. We'll do a thorough overview on this machine and all the features. This one has a lot of capabilities that most other finger brakes don't. And that's why it's called the ultimate box and pan brake or ultimate finger brake. And uh, we'll do a whole nother video on that.